So, uh, Howard, welcome. Thank you. Uh, so this, I, I've you know, really thought hard about how I got to, you know, um, actually introduce these guys, and I hope I do a good job. And I'm going to start with Bob Steers, uh, executive chairman of Cohen Steers, uh, um, Cohen and Steers. Uh, Bob co-founded Cohen and Steers with his partner, a uh, you know, gentleman you know, by the name of Marty Cohen, back in 1986, where they really pioneered the REIT mutual fund strategy. Um, early in his career, he worked with Citicorp, which is going to play into our story here a little bit, but that's where he met Marty. Uh, and fortunately for us, uh, he graduated from Georgetown University's undergraduate business school and has been an extraordinarily loyal son of the university. Uh, and I'm always really proud. I'm, I've, I've, I've really worked at two places in my life, and I've been proud to work at both of those places. And I'm always proud when I say I work at Georgetown. One, I love the institution, but two, to say that I am associated with the Steers Center for Global Real Estate because of the quality of Bob Steers. He's, a, he's, he's of the finest quality, and we're very lucky uh, to have him at the head of our ship here. So, and to his left is Howard Marks. He is the co-chairman of Oak Tree Capital Management. And man, I'm, I'm really... Uh, privileged to have the opportunity to introduce him. Originally from Queens, New York, Harvard, or Howard, excuse me, went to Wharton, uh, where he pursued an undergraduate degree in finance, graduated cum laude, then went to University of Chicago to focus on accounting and marketing, and he picked up a CFA as well. He was also at Citicorp for about 16 years. He was the director of research and the senior portfolio manager who, who oversaw convertible and high-yield debt. Uh, he joined uh, TCW in 1985, uh, where he was until he co-founded Oak Tree Capital Management in actually 1995 with partners from TCW. Now, there's tons of videos with Howard speaking, and I saw one of him from 2015, which really spoke to me, and he referred to himself as a teacher. Um, and that really resonated with me because I, I, I think we've all read his memos to clients over the last 30 plus years. And he's teaching. They're, they're very long lessons, but they are definitely uh, some of the best learning and teaching you're likely to see and read. So uh, that, that you know, spoke to me. Um, and at Georgetown, we talk a lot about value of an asset and its price, right? And so oftentimes a student will say, well, I don't like this investment. I'm like, what if I gave it to you? Assuming there's no environmental issues or something we don't know about. I'm like, yeah, I'd like that. So, so it's a price issue, right? So our students are very lucky at this point in time uh, to be able to have you know, uh, the opportunity to listen to Howard Mark. So with that, I'm going to turn it over to Bob Steers. Thank you very much, both of you guys, for being here. We appreciate you. Great. Thank you for that, Matt. And uh, thank you for the NTR panel. Um, I think this is a particularly exciting time to be gathering here. We've had a day and a half of board meetings uh, filled with uh, real estate investment professionals and students uh, trying to figure out where we are in the cycle, whether it's real estate, the economic, or uh, interest rate cycle. Uh, under the category of better lucky than smart, uh, Howard first said yes to, to luminaries uh, three years ago. Uh, and then COVID hit, and uh, that was that. And so we've been waiting for the opportunity to get back together again. And uh, I would s venture to say that you know this is uh, one of the most uh, uncertain times for a lot of these things uh, that we've seen in quite a while. So uh, I think it's really uh, an exciting time to have some someone uh, with Howard's experience and. Uh, I would add to the, the introduction uh, that Matt had, um, uh, Howard's really been a pioneer in, in many ways um, uh, in, the, in the high yield space um, uh, a long time ago. Uh, uh, as, as Matt said, a founder uh, of Oak Tree. Uh, I think, uh, Howard, you've also spawned a few other uh, money managers um, such as Double Line and uh, I, I, will, I will give you an assist on Cohen and Steers. Um, <laughs> Howard uh, hired uh, Marty and I, gave us our first jobs uh, out of graduate school in 1977, about 45 years ago, uh, as lowly equity research analyst when you were director of research at, at Citi. And so um, uh, thank you for being here. 
thank you for the many contributions you've made to the asset uh, management industry. So uh, given the environment we're in, um, I think uh, we have a lot to cover, maybe more than we can cover. Um, I'm thinking in terms of, of three broad categories. I think many in this room uh, read your uh, December letter entitled uh, Sea Change. And I know our firm and I think many in the discussions that we've had over the last day and a half agree uh, there is a significant, we're in the midst of a significant regime change. Interest rates, capital flows, uh, potentially liquidity, the banking system. So um, I'd, I'd love to, uh, for you to share uh, your, your thoughts on, on uh, that you articulated so well in your sea change letter. We obviously want to uh, spend some time on commercial real estate, especially uh, in the... Uh, uh, rates are going to be higher for longer, um, and what does that mean for the industry? And uh, lastly, if we have time, um, talk a little bit about higher rates, commercial property impact on the financial and banking system. So, um, but before we get into that, um, I, uh, particularly for the benefit of uh, the students in the audience, uh, I recently heard uh, uh, a personal story that you told about your initial job uh, search, uh, which uh, was somewhat shocking yeah. to me. Yeah. And uh, there's some lessons to be learned from that. So if you wouldn't mind sharing that, sure. that anecdote. Um, what Bob's alluding to is the fact that when I was getting out of Chicago uh, in 1969, I knew I wanted to go into finance. Uh, but I had no idea what I wanted to do within finance. I really did not have a leaning. And so I applied to six jobs in six different areas. Um, investment banking, investment management, uh, uh, pu uh, public accounting, corporate accounting, consulting, etc. cetera. And, uh, but I, I was kind of indifferent between the six, uh, in part because my knowledge of them was uh, superficial. But, <laughs> but uh, there was one that w seemed more prestigious and more glamorous than the others. So I said, well, if I get all six, I'll take that one. And that's the one I didn't get. So um, 30 years later, the guy from that firm who was the campus interviewer did something auspicious for Chicago. And I wrote him a letter and I said, I don't remember uh, I don't know if you remember me, but I interviewed with you and I didn't get that job, but I want to congratulate you on what you've done. Now, this was the days of letters. So that means it took him a week to get it and a week to answer. And then I heard from him a week after that. And, and I get a letter from him and says, uh, of course, I remember you and I followed your career and you've done great. And uh, by the way, if you ever want to know why you didn't get that job, give me a call. <laughs> <laughs> so now... It takes about 10 seconds to grab the phone. And I call him up and I say, well, thanks, Eric. What's the story? He said, well, it's simple. We hired the wrong guy. I said, oh, you know, you're sweet to say that. He says, no, no, no. He says, I don't mean it like that. He says, I mean that all the recruiters voted to hire you. And uh, when the partner came in that morning, hung over, he called the wrong guy. <laughs> <laughs> and... And uh, he actually, they actually gave the job to my roommate. <laughs> and this is a true story. And, uh, and I said, but I, I wrote, I, I talked about this in a memo I wrote in 14 about luck. Because I said that if it wasn't for that stroke of bad luck, I could have spent the next 40 years at Lehman Brothers and ended up with nothing to show for it. <laughs> so uh, the, the real lesson is... So literally, Lehman Brothers was the job... You yeah. didn't, didn't get That's the job I right. didn't get. And so what it means is, you know, there's an old saying that uh, man plans and God laughs. You don't ever know for sure what the right course is, and you don't know what to hope for. And uh, you, you kind of have to roll with it, don't you, Bob? And, uh, and, and uh, I think the great philosopher uh, Shaquille O'Neal was... <laughs> Uh, is, is, is a, it's experience isn't what happens to you, it's what you do with what happens to you. Well, I, I hope the students in the audience there get the message. Um, I think it's 
a good one. All right, so let's, let's, let's get down to, to business here. The, um, the sea change uh, memo that, that you put together, uh, I thought uh, was provocative. Mm -hmm. uh, and I, I won't, I won't uh, steal your thunder, but it, you know, it, it threw out uh, lessons from the past about uh, investors who get enamored with a particular strategy type of investing, you know, FANG, FOMO, uh, memes, all those types of things. And uh, if we really are pivoting or in a regime change uh, here, I think, uh, I think it would be helpful to, to think about what that could mean and, sure. and what does the next regime look like. Sure. Before I answer your question directly, Bob, I, I want to respond to something you said at the very beginning because you said this is a particularly uncertain time. And in my experience, there are two kinds of times. There's, when, there's the times when it, you know what's going to happen in the, in the coming 10 years and the times when it's uncertain. And the main difference is that the first time, it, you're wrong. <laughs> if you think you know what's going to happen, you're wrong. And that's kind of what my experience uh, showed. And, uh, you know, uh, um, I wrote a, a memo in October called the, uh, uh, the Illusion of Knowledge. And I quoted the historian Daniel Borston, who said that the enemy of knowledge is not ignorance, it's the illusion of knowledge. When people believe they know and present themselves as knowing, uh, it, it interferes with exploration. And uh, uh, maybe the other way of saying it is what, what uh, Mark Twain said, he said, um, it ain't what you don't know that gets you into trouble, it's what you know for certain that just ain't true. <laughs> and uh, so uh, I, I would say right now, Bob, we don't know anything for certain. There, were, there have been other times when we did know for certain, and we were wrong most of the time. But anyway. But it, it does seem that we're, you know, we've been through 40 years of declining interest yeah. rates, and yeah. f at least 15 since yeah. the financial crisis, right. and that's ending. And yeah. Yeah. There is this great unknown now. Sure. And I say in the memo that in 1980, I had a loan outstanding from the bank in Chicago, personal loan, at three quarters over what was called prime at the time. Uh, and uh, I would get a slip, crudely generated slip from the bank each time the rate changed. And I have framed in my office the one that says the, the rate on your loan is now 22 and a quarter. 19, December 19th of 1980. 40 years later, I was able to borrow at two and a quarter, fixed for 15 years. So this was a massive change. And uh, whereas I uh, uh, assert that I don't know much about the future, the one thing I'm sure of is that rates are not going to go down by another 2,000 basis points. Right? <laughs> and so if, if this massive period of, of uh, decline is over, then the question is, what does that imply for all the things we do? And, uh, and as Bob says, it was the 40-year decline uh, from, uh, from Fed funds rate of 20 to zero. And then more recently, uh, again, the Fed uh, set the Fed funds rate at zero at the beginning of 2009 to pull us out of the global financial crisis, uh, left it there for seven years for, for for some reason that I find in, inexplicable, uh, but, and, and kept rates basically low from the beginning of 09 through the end of 21. Thir and those 13 years are, are, are the subject of, that I explore most in, in the memo. And of course, this was facilitated by the fact that it, it, despite the high level of stimulus from the zero rates and quantitative easing, and the resulting decline of unemployment, we still didn't have inflation in that period, which permitted the Fed to maintain the, uh, that regime of low, in, low interest rates. Um, and uh, that, that's, in my opinion, what's over. Now, I'm not saying that rates having come down are going to go back up. I merely say they're, they, they, they'll probably kind of skate along here. Uh, and. Uh, you know, anybody who joined the industry in the last 15 years probably thinks we're in a high interest rate environment today, right. but we're not. We're in a normal interest rate environment, I would say, right. largely normal. 
uh, and I think we're, and, and, the, and the, so one of the tenets of Oak Tree's investment philosophy is that we don't predicate our investments on macro forecasts. We don't believe in macro forecasts, uh, especially our own. And, um, and so we try, but, but interestingly, you have to have some thought about the macro environment in order to make a prediction, and you have to predict earnings, cash flows, uh, whatever it might be, in order to be able to buy an asset. So, uh, but the answer is that we make neutral assumptions. And today, I think the neutral assumption is that rates stay where they are. Uh, so what do you do with that? Do, do, you know, do valuations revert to some historic mean? You know, what happens after 15 years yeah. of your 2% loan? Yeah. Well, uh, I mean, for, for every basic interest rate, there's a, there's a, a, a range of appropriate uh, discount rates or whatever you, uh, cap rates, whatever you want to call it, for every asset. Mm -hmm. And, uh, you know, the, the, uh, the cap rate that is, uh, a friend of mine bought retail on Fifth Avenue uh, 10 years ago at, a, at two and a half cap rate. I dare say that's Oops. not. <laughs> I dare say that's not appropriate today. Yeah, right. You know what is it for that property now? Seven or eight? Yeah. Okay. But anyway, um, you know uh, the the other thing is one of the one of the most important lessons is never confuse brains with the bull market. And uh, I was talking to Bruce Karsh, my partner, uh, two days ago. We had a call with a client. We're talking about this thesis. And when I got off, I called Bruce and I said, you know, what occurred to me is just think of somebody who had the idea to buy an asset, whether it was a property or a building or a company, within the last 15 years, and went to the bank and, got, and bought it with borrowed money, just before having interest rates decline steadily. You'd have to be seriously deficient person to lose money, you know? Uh, because the, the, the declining interest rates make every asset more valuable, discounted uh, present value of future cash flows. When the discount rate declines, the present value uh, increases. And then you borrowed money, and every time you had to renew your, your loan, it was at a lower rate. How could you not make money on that basis? Uh, this was a great period for uh, people who owned assets, Great period for people who borrowed money, and a double bonanza for people who bought assets with borrowed money. But if that's changing, if rates are done declining, then you have to know that. So, and I, I, I think uh, I want to save the real estate questions for a, uh, a little bit later. But so some of us have done the math on, so rates stay the same. The four and a half trillion dollars of mortgage capital out there uh, is going to refinance at the new rates, and there's projections that uh, to maintain current loan to values at, with these higher rates would require uh, an additional 500 to 600 billion of additional equity capital. That's just in real estate. Uh, I want to focus on the broad economy and markets. Right. Have you? If you believe that uh, that where we are today is not the, not only the old normal, it's the new normal, and it's going to maybe be higher for longer, maybe forever. Um, ha have you or Oak Tree thought through? Okay, so like the real estate example, if that flows through the economy, and I'm particularly concerned about away from real estate, I think more money's going into private equity, oh, yeah. financed probably with leverage loans, three or four year maturities. Mm -hmm. uh, we don't have any way of tracking that. In real estate, we can track. We know what's going on there. Um, and uh, if, if those loans are upside down, mm -hmm. what is the impact on the economy, on the market, on stock market, uh, on the banking system? Sure. Well, you know, I put out a memo last Monday about about the banking system, a lesson called Lessons from F, uh, uh, Silicon Valley Bank. And uh, I, I don't think that the bank is threatened. I don't, uh, the banking system is threatened. I don't think it's comparable to 08. 
Uh, you know, in 08, we, we saw Merrill, Bear Stearns, Wachovia Bank, Washington Mutual, uh, and ultimately Lehman uh, either disappear or require rescues or be acquired. Uh, I don't think this is, I don't think this is as, as, uh, as thoroughly uh, 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 taken up within the financial system as were the subprime mortgages and the relating RMBS. Mm -hmm. um, um, and of course, remember that the, the banks at the time were making so much money from packaging uh, mortgages into RMBS that they, they would bought, buy the bottom tranche in order to facilitate the process. Right. So, and I don't think that the, that the banks own the bottom now. They, they, uh, I think they own yeah. the top. Yeah. I don't think I, I'm not concerned about bad. the banking system yeah, either, okay. but right. well, the look, impact on the economy. Well, uh, people will, uh, you know, people are going to lose money because right. when you, when Bob talks about it, it requiring a, a half a trillion of equity capital to, to re-equitize the real estate industry uh, and, you know, a, let's say a similar amount uh, for the private equity industry, uh, what, he, what he omits to say is that the old equity might be gone. You know, somebody's going to eat those losses. Right. And, um, you know, Oak Tree's uh, greatest business is, in, is investing in distressed debt. Uh, and we started that in 88, and um, it's been a great business for us. But uh, it's, it's mostly predicated on the fact that even good assets can get overlevered. And if they're overlevered, they're the probability of getting through a rough patch declines. Uh, your ability to get through a rough patch is, is uh, all, all else equal, is proportionate to the amount of equity on your balance sheet. And uh, of course, when things are going well, people disregard that and they go for the highest leverage they can get because, uh, you know, as they say in Las Vegas, the more you bet, the more you win when you win. Um, <laughs> but so, I, so, so what we do is, we buy the debt of those over leveraged companies when they suffer difficulty. Mm -hmm. And we'll do it, and we do it with properties too. Um, and uh, because not everybody's gonna put in their, ha their, their share of the half trillion. Right. And not everybody has it to put in. Um, and uh, you know, and people let things go. Um, so uh, there'll be losses and uh, you know, uh, throughout the, the economy, throughout, certainly throughout the investment world, um, and that will, you know, ha have a, a deleterious effect on everything, and it'll, it'll seem, uh, you know, you, you think it's uncertain now. When that happens, everybody will be certain that it is going down the drain. Right. Uh, but, <laughs> of course it, but of course it never <laughs> does. And, and remember that I think the, the global financial crisis was much worse for the financial system than this is. And we got through that. Well, what do you think this is? Pardon me? What do you think this is? Are, are, uh, well, a plain uh, vanilla recession, typical cycle. Uh, yeah, you know, I, how does Oak well, Tree or you well, think well, about I think, it? Well, I think it's going to be a moderate recession. You know, I'm, and, by the, and by the way, that's one of the many forecasts I don't believe. But, <laughs> but I, you know, I, it, nobody thinks it's going to be an economic cataclysm. Among other things, you know, if you th the, the normal description of a cycle is boom bust, we didn't have a boom in the real economy. Right. We had the longest economic recovery in history of exceeding 10 years during, the, during this period I'm talking about, but it was also the slowest. So we didn't have a boom. Where, we, where you had excesses, but, perhaps, were in leverage finance, you know? And so, uh, so uh, e equity investors will lose money, and, and junior debt holders will lose money. Uh, I think that's what's right. going to happen. So uh, are, are you excited uh, you know, for the uh, you know, yeah. m transitioning from uh, a decade where growth uh, uh, did well and sure. value did not? Yeah. And, uh, feels like we're rounding into the perfect uh, opportunity zone for Oak Tree. Well, you know, I don't want to jinx us. <laughs> but, no, but the truth is that the, that the period I describe, look, if you look at 09 through 21, you had low and declining interest rates thanks to no inflation. You had 
a, a healthy economy stimulated by the Fed. You had a paucity of uh, uh, defaults and bankruptcies. You had no real fear. The greatest fear was the fear of missing out. Nobody was afraid of losing money. Uh, you had happy asset holders, eager buyers, um, easy access to capital. So you put that together, that's, that's a pretty uh, glowing period. And, uh, and of course, the trouble is that, that uh, Id idyllic periods like that encourage risk taking. Right. So people push up their LTVs and, uh, and uh, try to limit their equity. Sure. And, they, and they become willing to uh, engage in, in riskier assets. You know? And one of the interesting uh, hallmarks of the last 15 years was, you know, prior to 15 years ago, I think you couldn't issue a bond for a company that lost money. 15, and in the last 15 years, it became possible. Prior to 15 years ago, uh, the private equity industry, for the most part, would not invest in technology or software. And then they said, well, maybe it's okay. And, and, uh, and so you have a lot of tech and software that was the subject of LBOs for which a lot of debt was raised. And, uh, you know, these things will be tested. Buffett says it's only when the tide goes out that we find out who was swimming naked. Hmm. And the tide, the tide, we believe the tide will go out. So, right. so we're, uh, we're very optimistic. Yeah. Uh, uh, the, the, the 13 years I'm talking about were a tough period. Well, it was a great period for asset owners and borrowers. It was a terrible period for lenders and bargain hunters, which is what we are at Oak Tree. That's what we consider ourselves to be. And, you know, uh, the distressed debt funds, 35-year record, uh, gross return of 22% a year, unlevered. Now, if you can make 22% a year on unlevered investments, it gives you a sense for the bargains we were able to secure. That's how you make that kind of money. Uh, the value investor, his goal is to buy things for less than they're worth. Makes perfect sense. Yeah. Or most commendable, right? But the <laughs> trouble with that is that it requires the cooperation of somebody who's willing to sell an asset for less than they're worth. And that happens in the bad times. That happens when people say, you know, uh, I bought it at 100, it's 50 now, I got to get out or, before I lose the other 50. You know, and uh, things will never get better. Uh, and uh, that was not the case in the 13 years. So we had a hard time accessing bargains and uh, the, the, the funds in that category, for example, had the worst stretch ever. Now, they all earned at least 10, which is not the worst thing in the world, but it, it was far from our long-term average. Now we think we have a shot at the long-term average again because we think that there will be motivated sellers, for sellers, and you know, that, those are the people you want to buy from. So you're saying that we're entering the 20% zone? For us, yes, I think so. Really? I th well, I think so. And you, are we there now, or you think no, we're getting we're there? No, we're not there yet. Right. The, there, you need desperation. Uh, and how will we know that when we see it? We'll, we'll be buying. <laughs> <laughs> no, I mean, look, you, so you, 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 I actually argue for, for an activity that I describe as taking the temperature of the market. You have to uh, assess the mood. Uh, of the market participants. Are they happy and celebrating and, you know, putting down orders at the Ferrari dealer? <laughs> or are they, you know, hunkering down and, you know, telling their wives they can't go shopping? Uh, and and uh, we'll know, you know, you'll, you'll, we'll know when people are, are uh, suicidal. I don't think our real estate guys are quite there yet. No. But no. Well, you and I were talking before we started about denial. And, 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 <laughs> I didn't say that. I didn't say that. And, well, look, and what happens in illiquid assets, you know, what, what happens in, in, the, in the liquid markets, the listed markets, is that prices collapse. What happens in the private markets is that there are no transactions, right? Right. Because the buyer wants a price which is commensurate with current conditions, and the seller hasn't accepted that yet. Right. So, so obviously there's no meeting of the mind, there's no transactions. And, and usually, after a while, 
uh, somebody has to sell for any of a variety of reasons, and, and uh, that's when the prices of private assets decline. There's been, there's been a big discussion of uh, last year was one of the worst years on record for the stock market, and uh, first or second worst uh, year on record for the bond market, and maybe the worst year on record for the 60-40 mix of stocks and bonds, and yet m most private investors didn't mark down their portfolios much, if anything. So there's, oh. there's been a discussion of the propriety of that relationship, and every private asset owner has an explanation for why they haven't marked them down. Yeah, I've heard a few. <laughs> <laughs> And I, and I, and I, I want to interject here that, that they're not all nuts because we, you, the argument is that private uh, assets have not shown enough volatility, but I would submit that uh, public assets exhibit too much volatility. And you know, you, 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 when you mark your private portfolio, the decision rule can't be put set a price which is commensurate with the, uh, with the doomsday thinking that's prevailing in the public markets. That's not, that's not the right idea either. So that's a great segue. I, I'm going to uh, move into commercial property. Mm -hmm. um, I hear you've been making the media rounds bad-mouthing commercial property, so we're going we're gonna to delve into this a little bit. Um, so I think we all acknowledge rates are higher, liquidity is lower. Uh, REIT prices were down 25% last year. Non-traded REITs were up. Um, uh, we had a discussion uh, earlier in our segments that uh, while, uh, to your point, Howard, uh, while the public markets are a pretty perfect leading indicator directionally, with regard to magnitude, as you say, they tend to overshoot and, and undershoot. So, but REITs were down 25% last year. Private was, core was up. Uh, bid ask spreads are wide. Acti transaction activity has cratered. Right. Um, I think cap rates are starting to rise, um, but it's hard to tell with uh, a lack of transaction activity. Moving to the uh, real estate mortgage market, a four and a half trillion dollar market, about Seven or eight hundred billion matures each of the next four or five years. A third of loans are floating rate, um, and you know a lot of uh, multifamily and some office. Um, and again, probably a need to inject five, six hundred billion over the coming years uh, to um, maintain loan to value. So, uh, I guess I'm asking where what your opinion is of, of uh, that market and where do you see opportunity? Well, um, I, I believe that, as I said before, when interest rates go up, the notional value of all assets goes down. And last year we saw the fastest increase in interest rates in history. The Fed funds rate went from zero to four and a half in nine months. Never been anything like that before, uh, and uh, and, at, and and at the same time, uh, psychology swings from you know I always say that that uh, in the real world things fluctuate between pretty good and not so hot, but in terms of investor psychology it goes from flawless to hopeless, and uh, you know we're on the way. We've made some. We, it, nobody thinks the outlook is flawless anymore. I don't think anybody has accepted that it's hopeless, and I don't know if they, if they will, but certainly uh, psychology is, is more moderate today than it was. So you have higher rates, depressing value, you have a negative swing in psychology, and then in certain sectors you have a, uh, a real uh, deterioration of fundamentals, long-term fundamentals, maybe office. Right. And certainly, as, as you said before, certainly uh, uh, office that's not great properties. Old. Old. Old or ill-located or, right. or something like that. Um, so uh, now nobody can say whether the 25% decline of REITs is appropriate, not enough, or too much. Uh, but uh, you know, anything which 
hasn't been marked down is suspect. Right. In the uh, financial crisis, the, the peak to trough for REITs, 72 percent. Mm -hmm. So it, it, if, if REITs are an indicator at all, you know, to your point earlier, yeah. the magnitude versus 0809 is but, substantially different. But those are publicly traded REITs. Yeah. Now, one thing I, I, I want to stress to everyone here is that if you looked at a chart of the economy over the long term, uh, it would kind of look like this. It, it has a moderate slope and moderate fluctuation. The average, the long-term average is 2% a year, sometimes three, sometimes one. Occasionally four, and occasionally negative. But it's kind of like this. If you look at a chart of uh, profits, or maybe net operating income, it looks like this, right? Mm -hmm. the, the fluctuations are greater. Why? Companies and properties are levered. Uh, uh, companies in particular have uh, operating leverage, so when uh, revenues uh, decline by 20%, profits go down by half, and vice versa. And then they have financial leverage, so that whatever the change in the value of the asset is, the impact on the, uh, on the equity is magnified. So earnings fluctuate much more than uh, GDP. And then if you look at asset price, public asset prices, they go like this. What's, what makes up the difference? How do you explain the difference between this kind of fluctuation in profitability and this kind of fluctuation in prices? Psychology. Bingo. Psychology. People go from flawless to hopeless. So clearly, the uh, decline in the prices of REITs was overdone, right? And you went in and you bought a lot, and you made a lot of money. Right. So th this is why I, he says grudgingly, but, but this is why um, we can't say whether the 25% decline in REITs is too much or not enough. Right. So is Oak Tree looking at commercial property and would you invest, you know, it seems like, uh, uh, and I remember this from back at, uh, uh, when the energy market was in the tank and you went around and talked to institutions and nobody owned energy. Mm. Mm. And uh, I've heard today, I heard on the panel uh, today that everyone's been selling office for 10 years. Uh, nobody owns it. So They sold it, so you, just so they, they're waiting. they sold it, but nobody bought it. Exactly. Well, that's, that's my question. So everyone on the panel said 3%. Uh, the uh, office REITs only represent 3% of NARI uh, today, of all the public markets. So who owns office? I, uh, uh, you're, you're much closer to it than I am. <laughs> but, but, you would know, you buy office? Well, but this question, you said something about, you know, people, would people buy it? I want, and, and, and you've given me a chance to respond to something that Matt said earlier. Uh, if, I, if I gave it to you for nothing, would you take it? And uh, one of the things I talk about in the memo on the sea change is a change in, in the mentality in the investment business uh, around 77, 78, which is when you went to work and when I switched from equities to, to uh, high, high yield bonds. And uh, pr prior to that time, the job of the fiduciary was described as buying high quality assets. And this is one of the reasons we, 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 we both survived the Nifty 50. That's one of the reasons why the Nifty 50 did so well. They were considered great companies. And because they were so great, there was no price too high, which is the inverse of what Matt said. Uh, Matt said, uh, maybe uh, is there such a thing as, as, as a price which is low enough? When I started with high-yield bonds, which were really invented in 77 and 78, uh, Moody's defined the B-rated bond as follows. Fails to possess the characteristics of a desirable investment. <laughs> That's it. You know, and when I, uh, when I talk uh, to audiences like this, I say, you know, uh, I, I drove over here this afternoon. I got my car downstairs. I really don't need it anymore. I like to sell my car. And you have money. I know you have money. And you, you, and, and you might be able to use my car. So would you buy it? But I say to him, but there's probably one, pro one question that you would ask me, hopefully, before you say yes or no which is, what's the price? And Moody's was saying, 
that for a B-rated bond, there is no price low enough. Mm -hmm. And the converse is, for a high quality of asset, there's no price too high. Both of which were terrible ideas, which <laughs> now, that, and the first sea change that I lived through was the switch in that mentality. Because now, we don't say that the professional is somebody who buys high quality or low risk assets. We say, now we say, is it risky? How risky is it? What's the prospective return? Is the prospective return sufficient to compensate for the risk? That's what we do today. And you know, if, if we were still living in that mentality where it's the job of the professional to buy high quality assets, by definition, we couldn't have distressed debt funds because all the companies we've invested in were either bankrupt or considered certain to become so. How could you, how could you responsibly invest in those? Well, the answer is there, there's such a thing as, as low enough. And uh, the, the, the problem, of course, is that there's no place you can look to find out what that price is. And you, that's when you have to use judgment. But everything we're talking about here ultimately comes down to judgment, not algorithms, not formulas, not rules, uh, superior subjective judgment. So applying that judgment to commercial property. Yeah. <laughs> um, do you or Oak Tree have a view of what the, what the opportunity could be? So a lot of your comments about sea change are backward looking and yeah. learning yeah. from history. Yeah. Um, you know, most everyone in this room has got to figure out a way to generate high returns. Right. And in commercial property in particular, yeah. you know, we're kind of in suspended animation here. The you know, markets are clearly at a turning point or regime change. And uh, I, think, uh, I think no one here can predict where, where right. cap rates are going, where, um, you know, uh, whether liquidity will improve going forward. But do you have a house view? And, and you know, what is your view on the opportunity and property? Looking out three years, not today, but. Um, our mantra in, in investing in distressed situations has always been good company, bad balance sheet. If you can find a good company, well run, good business fundamentals, good business model, hopefully good management, and it gets over levered because it, takes, it participates in an LBO and then it fails to get through tough times, that's easy to fix. Mm. So, you know, we've, we've been successful in buying the debt of those companies and then you take it through a bankruptcy and the old owners are wiped out and the old creditors become the new owners. And if you bought it at a low enough price, that's, that's a good model. Which is as opposed to bad company, which is hard to fix. So we're not a turnaround investor, good company, bad balance sheet. And that, so in, in real estate, commercial real estate, uh, Today, we, you have good assets, which may be underwater, upside down, and will need more equity. And one way to do it is by buying the debt and equitizing it, uh, if the owners don't want to add more equity. Uh, and you know, if, if you can convince yourself that the, uh, that the uh, operating income is sustainable and the cap rate is uh, high enough, you buy it. And, uh, on a restructured basis. But it sounds like you're not uh, as focused on properties versus recapitalizing companies. Is well, that right? no. Well, I, I'm, my experience is with companies. We have a real estate division, but mm -hmm. that's not me. Um, and, uh, but the same will be true in real estate. You find a, you f find a, you know, a property uh, which is uh, where the price has fallen and, and the equity and maybe some of the debt looks like it's underwater, but you can convince yourself that the cash flows will be X and the, and the uh, cap rate based on that cash flow is Y and, and that's adequate to cover the risk, then you buy it. Good, com good property, bad balance sheet. Mm -hmm. But the question is always what do you do about the things you think are bad properties? Right. And you know, on the one hand, it's easy to say that for, I think somebody once used the expression that for an office building on Third Avenue, there's no price low enough. But Matt would say that there is. Uh, 
and question is, and the people who say, the people who will get rich are the people who say there is a price low enough and we're there and who turn out to be right. That's, that's how you get rich, but don't forget the latter part. You've got to be right. Mere, <laughs> merely buying things that have declined a lot is not enough. You know, you, you have to be right that, the, that there will be some cash flow. And, and I'll tell you, um, 20... 20 to 25 years ago, uh, we're, uh, Oak Tree's based in LA, and, and there were a couple of buildings, just a block or two from us, empty buildings, a mid-rise office, empty, that you could buy for a song. The question was, what, are they worth a song? Right. What's an empty building worth? And, and, and an empty building that's obsolete in terms of its qualities, what's it worth? And it's really hard to say. And, 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 that's, and I keep coming back to the fact that there is no f formula that you can apply. It's just personal judgment, you know? And uh, Sam Zell is famous for having applied that personal judgment and taking big risks correctly. And, uh, you know, we don't hear as much about the people who took those risks incorrectly. <laughs> All right, I want to leave some time for questions, but um, I'd love to just get your, your take on... Uh, uh, we've touched on it peripherally, uh, the, uh, the health of the banking system, um, you know, the impact of, of rising rates. Some have estimate, estimated it's reduced the value of financial assets by over $30 trillion. Uh, you know, we've had the SVB CS signature. Uh, we were talking inside earlier. You, you don't sound particularly concerned about uh, the health of the banking system? I don't think that, I don't think that the problems are systemic. And, um, you know, um, among other things, the, the banks usually take the top slice of the credit, and if they uh, loaned money at, at reasonably conservative loan-to-value ratios and took the top, they shouldn't. Have, have widespread problems, I don't think. Now, would you look at, I, I've, I've heard from some that, uh, that agree with your viewpoint, but hold out the likelihood that there'll be some uh, in individual regional banks mm -hmm. that have you know, idiosyncratic mm -hmm. risk and mm -hmm. made mistakes. Sure. So there'll, there could be some more of that. Would, would Oak Tree look at a situation like that? And were you looking at you know, CS or any of those? Well, we, 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 you know, we're, we're open to anything, you know. Um, we have to convince ourselves that the, that the fundamentals are sound mm -hmm. and that the price is low enough. Right. But we're, 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 cer we're, cer we're certainly open, open to it. Uh, and by the way, s the statistics, which uh, I got from a, uh, I think, reasonable source, which was probably you, uh, were that that on average, banks above 250 billion of assets have four and a half percent in real estate, and banks below 250 uh, billion of assets have 11 percent of assets in real estate. Right. The banks above 250 have half their uh, regulatory capital in in real estate, and the banks below 250 have 167 percent of their regulatory capital. So clearly. And, and some banks are in worse areas, and some banks concentrated by industry uh, and made inferior loan-to-value decisions and loaned too much to, lo quote, good long-term customers who are now gone. Mm -hmm. And, um, you know, some of them will have problems. There's no doubt about it. But I just don't think, I just don't think it's going to be systemic. Mm -hmm. And, uh, you know, if you look at 08, uh, when we had... Merrill and Bear and, and Lehman and others disappear, we still got through it. Those were much, much more important systemic uh, institutions, and we got through it. Right. So I think we'll get through it again. Uh, any concerns, you know, getting back to private equity uh, and how uh, that is financed, any concerns <coughs> about the CLO or leverage loan markets, which to me are somewhat opaque? Well, they are opaque, and, uh, but they look at your market and they think you're opaque. 
Um, but you know, it's, it, it's it, quality. You know, it, 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 the risk is a function of the quality of the underlying assets and the amount of leverage. And uh, you know, uh, so CLO uh, tranches right now appear to be offering very high rates of return, especially relative to their ratings. Mm -hmm. And you know, a tr an A-rated CLO tranche out yields an A-rated corporate bond by 300, probably. People make a big mistake when they take the ratings at face value. Right. You know, because, they, you know, uh, in America today, I believe there are three AAA companies. Uh, Mike Milken tells me that during the global financial crisis, or just leading up to the global financial crisis, there were 16,000 AAA CLO tranches. So something, something was wrong. <laughs> and we know which one was wrong. Right. So uh, I, I just want, would caution everybody in the audience who hasn't had experience that you can't take ratings at face value and you can't compare the, the rating on a corporate bond with the rating on a, on a uh, tranche uh, security. Right. Okay, Matt, we have some questions from the audience. Uh, yes, we do, actually. So, Howard... Um, what is a belief that you hold with which you think a lot of people would disagree with? Well, uh, I, I, I haven't had anybody, you know, it's uh, four months since I put out Sea Change, and I haven't heard anybody say you're right. You know, every, <laughs> everybody knows the, what the history shows, that rates are down and, and the stock market's down and bond values, uh, rates are up and stocks are down and bonds are down and, and uh, it's harder to finance, et cetera. Uh, but I think that most people are still treating it as a normal cyclical fluctuation, which is, which is different from a sea change. Uh, and if, the sea, if I'm right about the sea change and it, if my view describes the next uh, five to 10 years, then that's a very different story. So another question here. So obviously your memos are very widely read and you know, Warren Buffett is, pays attention, of course. So how do you determine what is memo worthy? You know, I, 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 I try to write when things need explanation and I try to write more when, when the world is roiled. Uh, and, uh, and, you know, and I... I, I prefer to write when I think I see something that most people don't see, because I'm trying to add value. You know, and and uh, that's why I started the SVB memo by saying, I'm not gonna give you another history of SVB. I'm gonna try to give you the lessons. To me, the most important thing is not what happened. The most important thing is what inferences should you draw from what happened, and, and what lessons should you learn. So related to that, you obviously write a lot, right? And there's a lot, you know, that, that's a challenging process, just, you know, the writing of, of things. So how do you think about writing? Like no, for me, it's fun. Uh, you know, I always point out that if you look at the, the, the memos, there's almost invariably one published in September and one published in January, which means that I wrote over summer vacation, I wrote over Christmas. <laughs> I, I'd rather write than not. For me, it's, 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 it's my creative outlet, you know? I get, I get great pleasure. Uh, from from writing, and uh, you know, it's easy to say that I get a lot of good put-ups uh, for the memos, and and that's my psych reward. But in the first ten years, from '90 to 2000, I never had a response. Not only did nobody ever say it was good, nobody ever said I got it, and and, <laughs> and, and I kept writing. I think I think you know for my own enjoyment. So we have a, actually a really good question from a student currently. Um, for young investors trying to, to you know, develop their subjective investing judgment, what is the best way to learn and grow? Well, the best way to learn is by being wrong for a while. You know, you learn nothing from success. Uh, and my, my uh, 2018 book was called the, uh, Mastering the Market Cycle, and it talks about the economic cycle, the profit cycle, the psychological cycle, the real estate cycle, the market cycle, all these different cycles. And the last chapter is, is on the cycle and success. And what I say in there is that you learn nothing from success. What you learn is, I can do it, it's easy, I can do it again, 
I can do it with more money, I can do it in other fields, and I can do it without my team. And these are terrible lessons. And, uh, and uh, you know, uh, I, I, the day I came to work in September of 1969 at Citibank's research department, if you would have bought the Nifty 50 that day, which career-wise I did, and if you held it for five years, these were the greatest companies in America about which people believed, number one, nothing could ever go wrong, and number two, there was no price too high. If you held those stocks for five years, you lost over 90% of your money. And that was very educational. <laughs> and and what, I took away from, what I took away from that was the conclusion that it's not what you buy, it's what you pay. And that success in investing doesn't come from buying good things, but from buying things well. And if you don't know the difference, you're in the wrong field. And so you got, you got to learn those lessons at some point in time. All right, one more, and then we'll turn it back to, to, to Bob here. So, Howard, um, how do you think about chat GPT in, the, in, in your memos in the future here? Well, I wrote a memo about six or seven years ago entitled Investing Without People. And I talked about uh, index and passive, systematic and algorithmic, AI and machine learning. And, you know, when I went to Chicago, uh, uh, the professor uh, told us that the statistics showed that m most mutual f equity mutual funds did not equal the S&P before fees, and the vast majority lagged after fees. He says, why don't they just buy one share of every stock in the S&P? There was no such thing as index funds at that time uh, or indexation. Uh, and of course, Jack Bogle popularized it in 74. And now I believe that passive and index investing accounts for the majority of mutual fund equity capital. Not because uh, passive results are so good, but because as, uh, active was so bad. Uh, and so, you know, if, if you go back to when we started, you could go into this business, you could hang up your signal, you could manage equity money, you could lag the S&P, and you could charge a high fee. The world's a smarter place now. And you can't do that. And that's why the money has flowed into uh, passive funds. And um, uh, by definition, on average, most people do average. And most people don't beat the average, which means they don't deserve high fees before fees. And they fall further behind after fees. So that was a flawed business model which is in the process of being corrected. And that's why a lot of money has been turned over to, let's say, machines, something mechanical. And um, I, I still believe that there are people who have superior insight and see things better. And uh, you know, the future is not a fact. The future does not yet exist, and we can sit here today and predict it. The future will develop. And there are people, a small minority, who see the future better than others and who understand the shape of the probability distribution and whether the expected return compensates for the pitfalls that lurk in the left-hand tail. Those people deserve to do very well. The rest do not. And uh, especially one of the crazy things that has changed during our careers is that now... Uh, incentive fees, people getting 20% of the profits, is ubiquitous. And, you know, uh, when you give somebody 20% of your profits, you're essentially giving them all the profit on 20% of your money. And that's pretty exceptional. And so you should only get that for exceptional performance. And, and, and the world hasn't really figured that out yet, I don't think. Uh, we have, there are thousands of hedge fund managers and thousands of private equity uh, funds, and they all get 20% of the profits. Um, Why do you think that is? I mean, hedge fund, ed, the hedge fund industry has, has under-delivered yeah. as much as active long-only managers know, have under-delivered. It's, it's a long story, but I'll take a minute. In 2000, the tech, media, and telecom bubble melted down. 
and the S&P 500 was down in 2001 and 2. The first three-year decline since 1939. And everybody lost tra interest in the stock market. The Fed took rates to one or two, and bond yields collapsed, and people lost interest in the bond market. So most people concluded that they couldn't get the returns they wanted or needed from stocks and bonds, and that was really the birthday date for so-called alternative investments. Mm -hmm. And what did they turn to first? Hedge funds, because hedge funds did quite well during, during that period. Uh, and so hedge funds that used to be 50, 100, 200 million dollars received billions of dollars, mostly from the pension industry. Right. And people don't understand that, that, the in, that an onrush of money changes everything. And I wrote a memo on hedge funds, I think it was around 05. And I said, you know, over the next decade, this is the only time I ever touched on hedge funds. And I said, I think the, the, the average hedge fund over the next 10 years will return between five and six. And over time, people will get tired of paying two and 20 to make five or six. Right. And Barron's called me 10 years later and they said the return was 5.2, we'd like to do an article. And still, there are trillions of dollars in hedge funds today. So, you tell me, you know? I mean, and um, I've been on a number of uh, investment committees at, at nonprofits, I still am, and my, the message I give them is very simple. There is no room in a forward-looking uh, pool of permanent capital for an asset whose only virtue is that it has a very high probability of producing a low return. <laughs> but, but people still own them, you, you know? Yeah. Now, I, uh, there's a lot of psychology, and I think one of the things is people, people feel that diversification is good, but I think Buffett would say that including a, a, a fund which is 80% likely to produce a 5% return is what he calls diversification. And he's, and he's right, of course. But, you know, people, uh, I think a lot of people say, you know what, the return's been rotten, but the day I sell it is the day it's going to start going up. <laughs> you know, I don't know why they do this, but there's still trillions in hedge funds. They're, it's shocking. Yeah. All right, my, my last question. And, and opposed to, as opposed to the commercial real estate, somebody actually owns them. <laughs> That's right. It's like office. Right. Yeah. Um, just getting back to sea change and some of the comments you've made, um, besides opportunistic or distressed investing where you obviously feel good about the, the return prospects. Uh, do you think as uh, the broad economy and, and the markets digest the higher for longer uh, scenario that we're broadly speaking destined to go through a, a multi-year period of low or no returns? Um, In for I think stocks, that, bonds. Well, look, when when because interest, you, you made the case when interest rates yeah. you know uh, uh, started their decline 40 years ago, mm -hmm. the S and P 500 uh, during that time generated 10 and a half percent annually, right. yeah. for, and you could just buy the index. It yeah. was free money. 10 and a half percent a year for 40 years is a lot for of 40 years. Profit. It's a lot of money. So when rates go up, everything has to offer a higher prospective return. Right in order to be at equilibrium with current conditions. And the only way, the main way you get to offering a higher prospective return is a fall in price. So there has to be a period of adjustment for, for uh, ownership assets, whether it be properties or companies or shares. Um, and uh, so I, I, you know, we, we saw some of it last year, and, uh, but there's been a substantial rally and uh, so my own personal feeling is that it's not done. But the other thing is that, as I said, that was a terrible period to be a, a lender. I think the current period is a better time to be a lender because the, you know, a year ago, high yield bonds yielded about four. There was a lot of issuance in the threes and there was even an issue in the twos. Can you imagine a high yield bond that yields 285? Um, but today, high yield bonds yield you know, and, and leveraged loans yield in the upper single digits. That's a useful rate of return. It may go higher yeah. as the prices go down, but that's a good starting point. Right. So, you know, uh, I think that, I think that uh, after 13 years in the wilderness, 
I think, I think that uh, credit investing is looking at much better returns. And, but someday, uh, ownership assets will get cheap enough that, that, they're, another, that they're a place to be. But uh, if, if interest rates are going to stay up, then there has to be a period of adjustment. You'll come back and let us know when that time comes? Anytime. Okay. Thank you, Howard.